Thank you very much, Rabbi Harav, for giving up your time to answer and go through all these questions with us. After I ask the question, if it's not anonymous, if you're here on the call, you'll have a chance to unmute yourself and ask any other follow-up questions. Otherwise, please send them in into the chat. Okay, so starting with the first question, it's about Biur and Bdikat Hamet. What should once Biur Hamet look like? Does one need to leave out pieces of bread? Can one speak during the Bdikat? All right, the last question first. Can one speak during Bdikat Hamet? Uh, Rav Sa'adya Gaon writes explicitly in his Sidur on page Kof Lamed Beth 132. He says, Lo ad I do not uh, see any cogent reason why anyone should disagree with that statement. It is reasonable and uh, logical that whilst involved in this miswa, one should be focused on this miswa, not, uh, not be involved in anything else, or any other conversation. <laughs> However, if it is something to do with the bidika at hand, something, a question that needs to be asked or something that needs to be said in connection with that miswa, then I think it is clearly mutar. Similar to... Um, the, uh, the fact that it is mutar to uh, speak between the uh, katha and eating bread when if you need to tell your servant or somebody to go and feel the animals because you'll have to do that before you can eat yourself. So if it's part of that miswa, it's somehow connected to the miswa of the kaf hamas, I think it is mutar. Otherwise, anything extraneous, one should not speak during the kaf hamas. Now, how long should Bidikat Hames take? To a large degree, this depends nowadays on, on how well the house was uh, checked and uh, cleaned and uh, everything was removed from the cupboards and uh, dusted and what have you, how thoroughly this was done. Because nowadays we, we tend to live in homes which are frequently larger than homes tended to be, shall we say, in the time of the Mishnah or beforehand. We also have many, much more furniture, many more cupboards and uh, places where things can be. We have cupboards and drawers and uh, shelves, and we have storage places so there are many places where a person has to check. One example is the car. Clearly, during the year, it's very, very likely that some hamas was brought into the car, and some of it may still be there, and some of it may still be edible. Another example of somewhere that you have to check is uh, bags, suit suitcases, bags that you take, back backpacks that you take when you go somewhere, when you go to work, when you go to to yeshiva, when you go to university, wherever one may go. Similarly, uh, bags, children's bags, school bags. Uh, more, than, more than a few parents have found in the middle of Pesach uh, an old sandwich left in the school bag by, by their child. So one has to check all these places. Now to check all these things in every place in the home and perhaps also in your workplace, to do all of that, in one evening on Leil Yod Dalad Ben Nisan is not feasible, clearly. And therefore, it is the common practice to, to uh, thoroughly go through our belongings and all our uh, nooks and crannies in the home, in the car, and in the workplace, and, and do all this well before Yod Dalad Ben Nisan. And if one has done so thoroughly, then you know that there is no hametz in that room and there's no hametz in this room and there's no hametz in that card because you checked it or your wife checked it or somebody that you can rely on checked it. Nevertheless, things can be forgotten and there are places that may have been overlooked. So you have to check everything, but you can go through 
uh, places that you know to be clean, that you see by the, the state in which they are in, you can see that they have been gone through and checked and reorganized and maybe perhaps they were tidy than usual. And you can tell that there's nothing there. So you can look, but you don't have to be quite so pedantic because it's been done before. It's precisely for this reason, apparently, this also has to do with this next question that was asked here, or in, in other words, part of this question about leaving pieces of bread. There, there is no hova to find anything. You don't have to find uh, bread. You don't have to find hames. You have to search for. You have to be bodek, livdok hames, is to look for, to search out, to see if there is some such hames in your possession. You don't have to find anything. If you want to get rid of it the week before, that's fine. So no, you do not have to leave out pieces of bread. You can if you wish, but uh, um, frankly, I would uh, recommend against it because let's say you put out uh, 10 pieces of bread and you don't remember where the 10th one is. So now you have one, you have definitely have a piece of bread somewhere in the house and you may not remember any longer where it is. So why, why go and get yourself into that buy, kind of a bind? So no, you don't need to leave pieces of bread. And uh, yes, it should be a serious bidika, but practically speaking, the house must have been gone through and your car and everything must have been gone through earlier. And, and therefore, where you are certain that there's no longer any chametz, you can be less than 100% uh, uh, fanatical about checking into everything because you know for a fact this was all checked before. If you're not sure, then you have to check it very, very carefully. So it can take quite some time. But in general, it probably should not take less, less than, than uh, 30 to 45 minutes, perhaps even an hour, perhaps even more, depending on, on one's a bird. And the other I minhagim mean, that some people have, like to use a candle or to carry around a feather while they're doing it, are those necessary? I do not think that the feather is necessary. Uh, the candle is based on what it states in the Talmud that uh, you, you have to do the Bidika or Hanir. Now, again, we know that. Uh, we we do not live and uh, spend our time at night in our homes or other places by the lights of candle by the light of candles. We have electric light, so electric light is sufficient, unless it's even better than a candle. Unless you're talking about some kind of a again some difficult to access place inside a cupboard, perhaps, and then instead of a candle, I would recommend a torch, a flashlight. And uh, I think does a, probably does a better job. And you're less, less, less likely to set the clothes and the, the wardrobe on fire uh, with that than with a candle. All right, thank you very much, Harav. The next question we have is about matzah. What is the Rav's view regarding matzah shmura? And the, the follow-up mm -hmm. question to that is, does it need to be shamur from the harvest, the grinding, or the kneading? And is there a difference between the first night and the rest of Pesach? This is a very interesting and uh, and, and it's a relevant question. It's a very interesting question in terms of the uh, analysis of the of the surya that we find in Pesach uh, Pesachim and the Talmud Bavli Daf Mem. A careful reading of that surya clearly shows that masa, what we call nowadays masa shemura, shemura misha, means misha'at kasira from the time of harvest. In other words, it's understood and agreed to by all that as, as long as wheat is attached to the ground, it cannot become chavetz, even if it gets rained on all the day, all day long. What happens when it's harvested? Let's say it's lying on the ground. Now it's been harvested. It's been uh, the reaping has happened, but it has not been collected. Well, it's frankly very unlikely that even if it sits about in the rain for days, in in, in that uh, in that kind in that state, that it would become harvest. And it's clear from the surya and the sechet pasachim daf mem. 
that the halacha is that it is misha'af <clears throat> lisha. Nathar shemura means a, a dough that was prepared knowing that and intending it to be used for nasa on Pesach. And therefore, certain precautions were, uh, were taken. And that, refers, and that is Misha'at Alisha, from the moment that the water comes into contact with the flower. But we also see in the Sulia that Rabbah, Resh Beth Adif, uh, Rabbah was nevertheless Mahmir on this topic. Uh, so was Ma, the mother of Marbarid Rabina, as it states in the Sufiya. In other words, they were Mahmir that it should be even Misha'at Qasira, even though the, the Talmud disproves this claim. And here again, we have an interesting uh, historical development. We see in the She'il <coughs> In the Shiltoth, in the Parashat So, Siman Ain or Siman Sadi, depending on your edition, the, the, the statement of Vala Shiltoth, which is the earliest post Talmudic halachic work that we have from the early period of the Gyoni, uh, there it states that you have to protect the masa or the flower from uh, water, or you have to be careful about how, how the dough is being produced and, and watched and, and how not leaving it uh, sitting around and, and to get it into the oven as quickly as possible. This has to be done. Minden maya illawe. From the moment that the water fell onto it. That's the lashon of the, of the uh, shield toth, which in simple terms implies that it's misha from the from the moment of of the mixing of the of the dough, the water and the flour. And then there's a second statement in the Shiltoth, which states, and there's a question about the correct reading, the correct Girosa. It says, well, In other words, it seems that this statement, it's been discussed by many Pusikim. It seems that this statement basically says that <clears throat> if, if um, the flour, or, or rather the, the uh, grains of, of wheat, were allowed to come into contact with, with water, uh, and the only people in charge, or the only people present, were either a non-Jew or a person who cannot be relied upon, <clears throat> then you would not be Yotzei the Chova with that, with that, um, with that Masa. So we have to repeat, the Vara Shintov states that it is Misha Atalisha, or from the point that the, the, the wheat, if the wheat, if you know that the wheat came into contact with water and it was not really supervised and you don't know how long was in the water and what, what have you then you would that's not called sh sh shamur that's what the barashid tov says but, but in other words he's he's not stating what rabba says rabba and the Talmud says it has to be mishat khasira on the other hand we find in uh, in the sidur of sa'adya gaon we find that he writes, Lokhim Tema, he says on page Kof Namad Gimel, Lokhim Tema, he tima, or Seorim, Shalona Falu Allah Shum Maim, Lolif Neta Hinatho, or Lahare. It seems from that person that you, you take flour uh, from, and you make flour from wheat, that, that water did not, which did not come into contact with water, even before the, before the grinding or after the grinding, it seems that he is. Uh, accepting the 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 more extreme or more mahmir position of Rabbah. And this is the furash what we find in some of the later Gilni. We find this in the Reef. The Reef writes this, the Rambam writes this. So according to the Reef, according to the Rambam, you must consume only Masa, Shimura, Mishab, Khisira, Kathira, all of Pesah. But as I have explained, 
the, the sugya doesn't actually say that. Um, the Rosh also agrees that this is not the Pshat of the sugya. The Rosh writes um, that it's Misha'at Lisha. And then he adds that in Sorfat and Ashkenaz, in France and Germany, in the Middle Ages, the, the custom was the Shomra Misha'at Tehina, from the time of the grinding of the wheat into flour. Because at that time, there was usually water. The, 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 uh, the mills, the flour mills, were usually run by water. So there was water in the vicinity. So you have to be careful from that point on. That's what the, the Rosh writes. And the run uh, on, the, on the reef uh, also states that Mishat Chesira is Miswa Min But it's not a Chobah. So, to sum this up, is it's uh, commendable and it's a miswamin of har to to uh, consume only masa or masa pro based products mishat, which is mishat kasira. But this is a miswamin of har; it's not a hova. It, it, the Talmud is quite straightforward that it, this is not a hova. Rabba's position is is uh, contradicted and rejected but the but the Tabu does mention that rabbi and, and others nevertheless were more, more mahmir but uh, the basic halakha is not so so if one can one should uh, be more mahmir but if it is difficult for various reasons sometimes it's a question simply of cost is much more expensive than uh, which is not but is also, which is definitely Misha'at Lisha and also definitely Misha'at Tehina, by the way. In other words, all other Masa, all other Masa products are, are definitely Misha'at Tehina, the Ma'ase. The only question is if, if it was also Misha'at uh, Misha Khasira. Where possible, being Mahmir is, is, is commendable, is admirable, but it's not an absolute Khubba. Thank you very much. Our next set of questions is about Hamet. I should have a... actually, sorry, there is one, there is a question here with regards to that last question. Is there a difference between the first night and other days? Uh, essentially, no, there is no difference. There is no difference. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. We have a question from Sammy. Uh, he asks, from my understanding, during the distilling process of making whiskey, the fermented yeast and wheat is evaporated and the whiskey is made from the cooled droplets. Shouldn't the distilling process of whiskey make the chametz voided? Uh, what the Rambam refers to as ansurat chametz omedet. And if so, should whiskey be allowed on Pesach or at least uh, be allowed to be kept in the house until afterwards? Very well. I wish to quote from a teshuvah of the Rivash. Rivash, uh, Talmud of the Ran, the Talmud of the Ran. He is asked a question. Um, <clears throat> perhaps I will share the screen with you for a moment. You may be able to see that he is asked a question about Agua Ardinte or something like that, which is some kind of distilled. Uh, liquor and the question and here we're talking about something which is distilled from uh, from uh, wine and the Rivash uh, in a lengthy fairly lengthy teshuva uh, claims that that which is distilled from something which is a source like Yen Nesech is considered like the, the original item itself and he brings proof for this from Masechet Machshirim. And I wanted to uh, read perhaps one particular line to you, if I can find it. Well, first of all, you can see this, this statement here. He says, That's with regards to the general... Uh, rule of thumb. I recall also that the Ya'abes writes this in his Sidur, that brandy, which is distilled from 
from wine is is a sword like the wine itself. I cannot see the line right now that I want to show you, but the the uh, the, the, the statement that the Rivash makes there is that the fact that it is referred to by some posakim as Zeab Alama, in other words, it's it's just the uh, droplets which are evaporated from the original substance, the original distillate, is not correct. He says that is true when it happens to somehow leach off the original item from its by itself, but if it is caused by heating and he brings proof for this and it is definitely considered like the, the the original article itself so without getting more uh, caught up in the in the, all the various chemical processes etc the essentially the over, overwhelming consensus of all the posikim and this statement by the way this psak of the uh, privash is brought uh the by Mahari Karo, Rabbi Yosef Karo, and Shohan Aruch Yerebe A, Siman Kof Kaf Gimel. The overwhelming consensus of the Posakim is that uh, whiskey, for example, which is distilled from from barley usually, almost almost exclusively, and uh, other other kinds of Vodka can be distilled. Not always is it so, but it's often distilled from wheat. Vodka can, can in fact be made from other things as well. You can actually produce vodka from wood, believe it or not. You can actually create, you can produce vodka based on wood and not on any grain. On wood? What did you apparently, just say? Apparently, you yes. You can produce vodka from wood? So, oh, so, you I, said wood? so I was told. By, in a barrel, maybe? <laughs> Know. Apparently, it's, it's possible. I haven't tried it, but I've I've heard from people who are in the know that it's even possible to do that. But it's not maybe as good as as uh, the regular product. But it certainly can be produced from wheat. It can also be made from corn, in which case it would not be the same. If it was only corn, shall we say, that would be kikniot perhaps or something like that. But uh, whiskey is always made from barley. Barley is one of the hamish daminim, and therefore it is asur. We can't uh, have that, right? On Pesach? No. If someone could uh, mute themselves, please. Whatever that may be. Um, to get back to the to the question. Um, what was the question again exactly? Uh, yes, so with regards to drinking on, on Pesach, no, absolutely not. Now, why is this uh, the, the person asking the question? Sammy is suggesting that it has to do with the halacha of en, uh, uh, en surah hamets or meda. I'm afraid to, to tell you this has this is the an entirely uh, incorrect comparison or or um, or, um, or concept being introduced here. This is not the relevant concept. I will share the screen here with Rambam. I want, I want to show you what the Rambam writes here for one moment. Rambam here in Halakha Yod Aleph. This is in Perek Dalet, as you can see, in Chod Hamesul Masa Perek Dalet. Halakha Yod Aleph. Here Rambam states that clothing, garments that were washed uh, with a mixture which included wheat germ, Helev Hita, Luchen Niyarot Hedib Bekuot and Bahames, and paper, that, pieces of paper, like in a book. They used to use this to to uh, help with the binding of the book. They used to glue piece, pieces of paper together with glue made of flour and water. This may be kept during Pesach. In other words, it does not look or seem or resemble any kind of hamez. It's also not edible hamez. You don't eat such glue. Uh, nor do you eat the uh, or drink the the mixture of of various substances that are used to to launder clothing. 
So this this has nothing to do with our discussion here. Here we're discussing something which is most definitely edible. And people pay a lot of money to buy these things and to eat them or drink them. And uh, this is this pasuk is not not relevant to our discussion. This I'm, I'm sorry. This concept is not relevant to our discussion. That's with regards to um, the question of why why is this not considered en surat hamas omedet. This is very much omedet. The, here the the essence of the original hametz tarobet uh, hametz is is now distilled, and that's basically the the the, the es essential essence of that original substance. As, as the Rivash explains. Now, with regards to what you can do with your whiskey <clears throat> or similar uh, alcoholic beverages over Pesach, first of all, I recommend to all not to sell hames gamur, which means bread, crackers made of hames daminim, usually wheat, um, pasta, etc. So that those products are hames gamur. I recommend strongly not to sell hames gamur, to get rid of it, eat it, give it away, sell it, throw it away, whatever it is. <clears throat> With regards to things like uh, whiskey, if one can find a non-Jew who is willing to buy it from you and pay you for it, and you can you can sell it for less than its market value. You're allowed to do that if it's to your benefit. You're always allowed to sell something at lower than market value. If a person has a home and he wants to sell it, he needs to sell it quickly. He'll sell it for less than the market value. You can sell it for less than the market value. You can tell this person uh, it's yours, and you can do what you like with it. It's not mine. It's yours now. But if you're not interested in it, or if you have it still after Pesach, I might be happy to buy it from you. Uh, we can discuss it afterwards. I'm not promising to do so, and you don't, you're not promising that, to me that you will sell it. That is a that is a, a mechira gemura. That is a complete sale. That is not a legal fiction. That is the best thing to do. That's what I do, uh, and that's what I suggest people people do. Uh, I, I I recommend avoiding using uh, the, the standard mechirat hamis uh, practice and, and transaction that goes on, which is clearly a, can fairly be described as a legal fiction. It's well known, by the way, that the Gra, the Gomi Vilna, was uh, very unimpressed with the mechirat hamis that is customary. One, keep, one should also keep in mind the fact that this large scale and, and common practice of, of selling hummus began precisely for this reason uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, in places like Ukraine, Poland. Jews were licensed by the government, by, by the local lord or baron or what have you, or the central government. <clears throat> They were licensed to uh, to distill alcohol, to sell it, to to uh, they were given a, fr a franchise to do so and to run uh, pubs and bars where they would sell it, generally to the to the non-Jewish population. And so you had many Jews who whose livelihood, which was anyhow precarious, depended on on uh, their on this business, where and and part of this business meant that you had sometimes a whole warehouse full of uh, full of such a product, which we had no way of getting rid of. You couldn't do so, and also you were licensed, and it was uh, it wasn't maybe entirely yours uh, legally. It belonged partly, to, at least, to the nobleman or what have you. So the, the Jews were in a bind. So it was a real shahat uh, de a very difficult situation. And that, that's where the the, uh, the more uh, fictitious type of mechirat hames came came into into being, as as the Bach and others describe. But a, a person who is not in that line of business and is not, does not need to do so to in order to survive 
financially. It really has, has no uh, real uh, cogent reason to, to uh, sell all kinds of items that one can simply get rid of or not, not have in one's possession during Pesach without any real financial loss. Thank you very much. And given the fact uh, that the whiskey is a taroveth, if somebody did keep it on Pesach, would they be allowed to drink it afterwards? That's a, that's also a good question. And uh, there is a mahaloket on, on this. Many posikim understand that if the, this taroveth hames, why, why, is it, why is whiskey a taroveth? Because the actual distillate is considered by it's a machloke whether it's considered the the pure distillate from the from the uh, barley mash that that is is the basis uh, the basic ingredient of, of the whiskey shall we say there is a machloke whether that's considered hames gamum in torah or hames midivre soferim because it's by way of distillation but either way it's a sore as we said but then the, the what you get in your bottle of whiskey when you buy it in the store is mixed with water. It's it's forty percent. It's forty five percent whiskey uh, alcohol. It's not. It's there's water added to it. So it is a tarovet. With regards to tarovet, many posikim are of the view that if this tarovet existed in this form before Pesach, and now it's hamis tarovet hamis shavar aloha Pesach, and it was in your possession, that then you're not allowed to use, make use of it after Pesach, like like hamis gamur. When does it make? When is the fact that it's something is a tarovet uh, more? When can you be more mekel according to these posikim? When you had something which was hames before Pesach and it was, it's now hames she'avar alawa Pesach. It was in the possession of a Jew during Pesach and should not have been, and now after Pesach it got mixed up with other substances. So let's say there was, uh, there was there was uh, some kind of. Uh, Hamez product, and then it got mixed up after Pesach with with a similar uh, product that was that was not Hamez before. It, well, it didn't exist before Pesach. It got mixed up with 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 the, with the same kind of product that was produced after Pesach, and now it's a tar of it. And then they say you can, we, we are mekel when it comes to Hamez Shavar Alawa Pesach Pesach that was in the possession of a Jew, when it has now been mixed with with other things which are mutar. So according to many posikim. If it was a tarovet hametz before Pesach and you had it in your possession during Pesach, you may not use it after Pesach. It is possible to understand. <coughs> excuse me. It is possible to understand from the words of the Rambam that any tarovet hametz, even if it was a tarovet before Pesach and now it's the same tarovet after Pesach. Uh, the din of Hamesh Shavar Alawa Pesach does not apply to a Tarovet Hamesh, but only to Hamesh Gamur. And this is how Mori uh, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yosef Gafe Hazatzal, and this is how he understood uh, the Rambam. And, uh, and he quotes other uh, Hachamim in Teman who, who understood this halacha in this fashion. So, frankly, I am. Uh, Uncertain which of these two interpretations is is the uh, is the more correct, uh, and seeing that the isur of Hamesh Avar Alawa Pesach is uh, in an isur a kenas midivre soferim is not min and and I think it's difficult to to uh, to get to the bottom of this uh, matter with with certainty. So I think we can be be careful. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Naomi. Do glass vessels, which are used for hametz during the year, need to be koshered for Pesach? And she has a similar question about stainless steel vessels with no joints and seams. All right, so uh, let's take one thing yeah, at a okay. time. Let's deal with the glass first. Glass vessels that were used for hametz during the year, do they need to be koshered for Pesach? The simple answer is no. It states in Avot to Rabbi Nathan that uh, they do not absorb, which is also uh, 
as a scientific fact and it can be seen with the, with one's with the naked eye if 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 it were true that glass vessels absorbed then you would see something so that's number one now i have heard the claim that what it states in Avotu, Rabbi Nathan was talking about cold substances and not very hot substances, because in, the, in, in ancient times, glass where could not uh, could not be placed into a very hot oven, shall we say, would just burst because of the heat. In other words, glass was was unable to, to uh, survive a very hot environment like an oven. Whereas today, if we're talking about uh, a Pyrex or Duralex a baking dish, which is also glass, but it's it's been tempered and has had certain uh, substances added to added to it, and it's manufactured in a certain way so that it does expand when when heated, but it does not crack and does not uh, shatter. There are those who claim that that should, that that cannot be compared to the glass mentioned in Avodah Rabbeinu. I do not accept this claim, nor did. Uh, Moreno Agaon Rabbi uh, Shaul Israeli Shlita. Uh, I said Shlita. I knew him, but uh, that was a long time ago. Zecha Tzadik Libracha. Rabbi uh, Agaon Rabbi Shaul Israeli was one of the Rashi Shiva of Mekaz Arav and great, a great Hacham and Posek. I spoke to him personally on this subject, and I can tell you exactly when it was. It was one of the first days of Hodesh Nisan in the year Tao Shin Mem Beth, 1982, living you know. Uh, and I asked him exactly this question. And he said, in his view, all manner of Duralex, Pyrex, uh, dishes and cups and what have you, they're all, they have the same din of glass and they do not, they do not absorb and they can be used for Pesach. They do not, do not need to be cushioned. And that, that is my uh, opinion, without doubt. I have no doubt about that. If we're talking about a uh, baking dish, which is used during the year uh, with all kinds of greasy uh, foodstuffs and, they, and things tend to, to uh, get baked on in such a way that it's difficult to clean them off, well, then you either have to somehow clean it off the, despite the difficulty, using the right... Uh, substances, the right uh, oven cleaning and what have you, uh, um, substances and sprays and what have you that are out there, and a bit of elbow grease, you can you can remove just about anything, I think. But if you if you find there's something that you cannot remove, then then, then don't use it on Pesach, then, then get, have another one, buy another one if necessary. But most things really can be cleaned completely and, and, and successfully if, if one puts one's mind to it. Of course, if one is a, a more of a yeke and cleans everything immediately during the year, then you won't get, you won't find yourself in that position. With regards to stainless steel, the truth is, min hadin stainless steel also does not absorb to any significant degree. the The absorption of stainless steel parts is uh, basically on the atomic level. So I was, it was, so it was explained to me by, by Harav uh, Moshe Antelman Zetzal, who was also a doctor of, chem of uh, chemical engineering. And he, he said to me, we're talking about three or four atoms. But nevertheless, here I'm being Mahmir, I think that stainless steel utensils should be, go through a process known as, as Hagala before Pesach, which is fairly easy to do. In many places, you have uh, you have this set up outside in the street, or have you in Israel at least? I imagine you could start in some places as well, where you can you can take your utensil there and they they place it in boiling water and and it's done. It's straightforward and simple. You can also do it at home. You can uh, boil water. Uh, let's say fill up a pot to the top, boil water in it, and then when it begins to overflow, it's, it's kasher. You can do, and do the same with the stainless steel uh, cutlery, uh, etc., etc. With regards to joints and seams, I think again, almost all joints and seams, handles, etc., things of this nature, can be very thoroughly cleaned with all manner of uh, oven cleaning and and, and uh, you know industrial strength, so to speak, or pesach strength. Um, uh, leaning substances 
it's clear that any possible um, residue of food left on in the crack in some nook or cranny or joint of a, of a handle or something like that, once it comes into contact with any of these highly toxic chemical substances, is uh, is nifgam lahalutin. It's completely inedible and, in, in fact, completely toxic. And you're well advised uh, to th thoroughly clean it afterwards uh, and not have any any of that residue. Having done so, whatever whatever may be there cannot cannot possibly render the pot or or the utensil uh, not not kosher the pesach. Thank you. No, Naomi's follow up question on this is: Either way, should we be concerned? at all about Marith Haring by using such everyday kelim on Pesach? No, there is no such in Yan. The, the, the entire Jewish world is, uh, the, the accepted custom is to take dishes that are used. Some people have special dishes. They have an entire kitchen worth or a whole special cupboard of kitchen of, of Pesach utensils in their kitchen. Uh, but many, many people uh, kasher at least some of their utensils for Pesach, and, and no one considers this to be in any way a problem. Thank you. Our next question is from Ahava. Can quartz be koshered in, a, in the kitchen, or should we still cover the counters? All right, so let's just explain what we're talking about so that everyone uh, knows what we're, what we're discussing. A quartz countertop it looks uh, similar to um, marble or some other kind of stone countertop. It's not, it's not a natural product on the one hand, like marble. Uh, quartz countertops are usually 90% quartz, which have the same halachic state, status as, as a stone. Um, and the, the rest of the, the makeup of this material are, are pigments and resins and, and what have you. But they do not, they do not change the basic uh, status of, of this substance, what, what, what's called the, the quartz countertop, or what's called here in Israel, the uh, Ebn Kesar. So it has, it has the same status as stone. It needs to be cleaned thoroughly. I, I recommend cleaning uh, a countertop with... Uh, again, with all the best uh, utensils, uh, all the best uh, uh, substances, and scrubbing everything down and making it spick and span completely, and then pouring boiling water from a kettle <clears throat> over the surface. That is what I recommend. And then you do not need to cover the counter after that. Thank you. We have an anonymous question about the Chamesha Thaminim that asks. Why is beer considered hametz? Because it is made with barley, and barley is not one of the five grains by the Rambam. All right. Well, this question is uh, based on a misunderstanding. It is not barley that is is not is not one of the five grains according to the Rambam. It is oats, not barley. Barley is most definitely, without a doubt, one of the hameshet one of the five grains. No one has ever suggested anything other, anything different. And this is why the Rishonim, like Rabbeinu Tam and Barosh, etc., were discussed the status of beer on Pesach because beer is generally made from from barley. It can also be made from wheat, but generally made from barley. And uh, they explain why it's a sur on Pesach, and it's, it's even considered to have a kezayit kedachilaf peras. In other words, there's quite a lot of chametz in beer. So beer is, is uh, even though it's a taro, but nevertheless, there is a lot of chametz in there. And it is most certainly all beers, whether made from wheat or barley, are asur. Unless we're talking about a beer. I've seen such beers in Israel, at least. They probably exist elsewhere. Uh, there is, there is a, a certain type of beer that you can buy, which is uh, fermented from dates. Which is exactly the kind of beer that the Talmud Bavli constantly discusses. That was that was what they made beer from in Bavel because dates were in were, there was a huge supply of uh, of dates. Dates were 
were everywhere and they were cheap. So they, they used, they made many things from dates, including beer. So beer made from dates is kasher, if, if it has a hechsher. Why does it need a hechsher? Because uh, one has to see exactly how was it made and where it was made and whether it was not uh, made in such a way that it could have uh, some other kind of beer a little bit left, left in there or something like that in the, in the vat. But if it's purely uh, based on, shall we say, dates or something like that, which is not at all hametz, then it's mutar. But regular beer made of wheat and barley are most definitely a sword. What, what I have said in the past, what people have heard me say in the past, was uh, I was referring to oats. Oats, according to Rashi, uh, and according to most posakim, is one of the hamish damin and is a sur in any form or any shape or form during Pesach. However, uh, it seems clear from the Yerushalmi, and it's uh, clear from the Rambam, who states that the Hamesh Minim are three types, three varieties of barley and two varieties of wheat, that uh, this does not include oats, because oats are, are simply not a variety of barley or of wheat. They don't look the same. They don't taste the same. Oats naturally have no gluten in them. You can not produce uh, bread, uh, any kind of bread that will rise from oat flour. This is why oats, oat grain, oat, oat meal is not used to make bread anywhere in the world, even in Scotland, where it was the, the, the staple food. Or how did they eat it? They made porridge out of it, but not bread. You can mix oat meal with wheat flour and, cre and make bread like that because you have wheat and you have gluten. But oats by themselves do not produce bread. Uh, so it seems clear to me on the one hand that oats are not one of the minim, one, not one of the grains which is a uh, sore on Pesach. It's basically like a kitnith, like uh, corn or like uh, rice. But because Rashi says emphatically and plainly that it is considered one of the hamishta minim, and it is uh, the general practice not to not to consume oats during Pesach. I I refrain from eating oats on Pesach, and I suggest others do the same. Thank you. So to clarify, gluten equals chametz, right? Without gluten, without gluten, you cannot have chametz. The process of fermentation that occurs when you mix, uh, shall we say, wheat flour, or, or spelt flour, or rye flour. Rye also has uh, gluten, less than wheat, but it has has gluten. With water, it's only when the the uh, the gluten in the in the wheat meets the water that it, the, the fermentation process begins. That is why rice is also mutar, uh, unless you hold by the minhag of kitniot, in which case it's 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 a kitnith, it's a legume, but or a type of legume, but there is no gluten in, in rice, and therefore rice cannot become hamas. So to answer uh, Mir's question that he just sent in the chat, rye is hamas, ah. even though it's not a type of wheat or barley. Yes, a good question, and this is important to point out. It seems to me that rye is most definitely should be considered a, a grain that becomes can become hamas. We know that it contains gluten. And we know that you can make bread from it. This has been the reality for probably a, a 2,000 years or more in parts of the world where rye was the staple grain, places like uh, Eastern Europe, Northern Europe. It's not one, of, but it's not considered one of the Hamishta Minim. So it's actually, I think today we know of six Minim, not five, but six Minim, Sheshita Minim, that can become Hamish. So we have the, the various types of wheat and spelt and barley. And we also have rye, which rye was not a grain that uh, existed in Eretz Israel in, in ancient times. It is a grain which is native to Northern uh, Europe, Northwestern Europe, and also Eastern Europe because of this. it requires cold, cold, it survives in the cold. It's, it's, it's just a native of, of that kind of climate and, and it's, uh, can uh, survive very, very wet conditions where things like wheat would simply rot. Uh, so it's a, it is, rye is a sur 
on Pesach, even though it's not one of the classic Hamishta meaning, today we have Shish, Shishet meaning because we have foods and, and, and grains from different parts of the world which did not exist in, uh, in Eretz Yisrael 2,000 years ago. Thank you very much. We have a series of questions from Yohanan, who I believe is on this call right now. So after any of the questions, Yohanan, feel free to unmute yourself and follow up. The first question is, are wine biscuits kosher for Pesach? This question comes up every year, and uh, it has been discussed by many Rabbanim for decades. And I uh, will tell you plainly that I have no idea whether it's mutar or so, because I have heard the claim that there's no water mixed in there. It's uh, it's made with wine, uh, and no no additional water is added to the to the dough when these when these biscuits are made, and therefore there's no reason to consider it hametz. And this is why apparently uh, Harav Hagon Harav Ovadia Yosef Zetzal gave a hechsher to such the famous company uh, Papashado, I believe it's called here in Israel, that produced these wine biscuits made of uh, kemach matzah and wine. On the other hand, other Rabbanim, including Rav Yosef's son, Rav Yaakov Yosef, and Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, were vehemently opposed to this psak, and they said that it's not true because there is a certain ingredient, I don't know which one it is, I don't recall right now, someone wants to explain this to me, that when it's mixed up with these other ingredients, it, it somehow water is produced. I, I don't know exactly how. I've never been able to really fig figure this out, at least not, not to, to date. And somehow there is water pr produced in this mixture, and, and therefore it should be a soup. I'd, I've not been able to get to the bottom of this, I'm afraid. And therefore, I, my answer is I do not know. Because I do not know, and because it is a uh, suffix that at least uh, some Rabbanim consider to be a very real suffix, a very real uh, possibility, if not more than that, that it is hummus. I would suggest not eating them on Pesach. Eating before Pesach or after Pesach is fine. But during Pesach, I would say don't eat them. Rather than eat such things, I would say uh, things like rice crackers, which, which uh, exist uh, Certainly here in Israel, I imagine overseas as well. Um, there are rice crackers which are sold with um, uh, various, uh, very high-grade uh, hashkahot, uh, certified as kasher. They're made from 100% uh, brown rice. Uh, that, that I suppose is a good, a good substitute for any such thing. If you want something sweeter, then you have to buy some some other product, I suppose. That's with regards to those uh, wine biscuits. Next question. Next question. Um, oh, sorry. If, if, if I may follow up, yeah. Um, so that suggests, um, correct me if I'm wrong, that more, uh, at least uh, in, in theory or more generally, um, making a, a, a dough which is not from water but from uh, mepiros would be um, permissible. Um, and things like uh, maybe, you know, matashira. That is that is correct. In other words, yes, I believe without a doubt the halakha is that uh, that when you take flour from one of the the relevant grains and you mix it with meperoth, shall we say wine, shall we say fruit juice, oil, uh, eggs as well, etc. And there is absolutely no water whatever added to the mixture, then that is not considered hummus. This is the opinion of uh, the Rambam in the Mishneh Torah. This is the opinion of the Ravya, the opinion of Rabbi Nutam. It's basically all the Rishonim. Rashi uh, suggested that it should be considered hummus nukshe, and it should be a sur bachiram midivre sofarim. Uh, the, the basis for this cl claim is is not not very not very uh, clear or convincing. On the other hand, there are explicit statements in the Talmud that say the opposite. So it, it makes sense to accept that position. The, although the Rashba 
um, claims that the Rambam changed his mind. And there is, even, even on the manuscript of the Rambam's Perush on the Mishnah, there is a, a note written on the side of the page of the manuscript suggesting that the Rambam said something along the lines of that Rashi said. But um, again, it's not, it doesn't seem that way from, from, the, from many of the sources. For example, in the Mishnah, in, uh, in Masechet uh, Hala, I'm sorry, no, in Masechet Terumot, when it talks about um, a dome where a an apple or apple, uh, crushed apple or something was added to, to the dough in order to cause it to be mahmis. So some Rishonim said, or some Mephashim thought that this, in, it, this proves that even though it's meperot, it can become uh, hames. But the 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 the, the, shat, the the way to understand what's being said there is as follows. It says that if you had a dough and then you added this crushed apple paste or uh, apple sauce, whatever it is, to the, to the mixture, uh, that would be that would could cause it to be mahmis. Yes, that's true. But how did you have a dough in the first place? You have a dough first because you had water and flour. You had water and flour mixed together, and then you added something else to it to cause a, a further uh, development or something, something to you wanted something to happen with this dough. But first, you had the dough. The dough was not made entirely of crushed apples and 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 uh, or apple juice and and flour. So. Many sources indicate clearly that if there's no water in, at all in the mixture, that it is not hames. So that you, therefore you can make masa ashira with eggs uh, and, or, or a combination of these things, eggs, flour, uh, oil, uh, what have you. And yes, that's, that's not, that cannot become hames. That is true. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, is it permissible to eat a non hametz dish which was prepared in a hametz pot before Pesach? If the pot in question, the hametz pot in question before Pesach was entirely clean and there was no residue of hametz residue in the pot, then the answer is yes. The next question is, with regard to products, uh, sorry, what bracha should be made on matzah, both soft and hard matzah, during Pesach and during the rest of the year? Soft matzah, without a doubt, is bread is path, l'chol davar o'inyan, and the bracha all year round, so such a thing is hamusi lahem in ha'ares, similar to buying a pita or a saluf or esh tanur or whatever you call it, a lafa. It's the same thing. Whether it's leavened or not makes no difference. It's bread. The chapati is the same thing, for example. All right. With regards to hard masa, there is a mahloket. There is room to question whether the correct bracha, which is what the Ashkenazim do all year round, they say hamosi on, on hard matzah, on cracker type matzah all year round, whether that is correct, or the practice of the Sepharadim, which is on that kind of masa, they say Mizanoth uh, all year round and Hamusi only on Pesach. The truth is, one can bring fairly reasonable, cogent arguments to on both sides of this of this discussion. Uh, however, it should also be pointed out that even if we consider cracker type Masa to be have the halachic status of Patha Ba'ab the Kesanin. Or the Kisanin, if one makes a meal out of it, which is usually what people do if they sit down with a box of cracker type matzah, let's say they're having some matzah and some herring and what have you, as you know, shodashidas and shodashidashid in, in your local Ashkenazi shul on, on Shabbat afternoon. Well, uh, that's a seuda, le chol davar we'inyan, you are kove a seuda, and when you're kove a seuda on, on such a thing, the bracha is hamusi. And, and afterwards, because Amazon, no question. Even if you uh, ate, uh, made a meal out of uh, some honey cake, because there's nothing else and you're hungry, and this is your dinner tonight, so you ate a fair amount, quite a lot of honey cake, you say Hamosi, and you say Bikat Amazon afterwards. So 
the question only really arises where you're planning to eat a small amount of matzah, like a, some kind of a small snack, but nothing more than that. Okay. Thank you, Rav. Okay. Thank you. One more question. With regard to products which do not have chametz ingredients, how crucial is it for them to have a kosher for Passover label? label? Because of the nature of uh, modern modern food production, industrialized food, food production, it is necessary to have uh, a reliable kasher lefesa hashkaha or label on, on on almost all products, with the exception of um, things like tea bags, uh, coffee, ground coffee beans, instant coffee, uh, sugar, and salt. Those kinds of products we know with certainty are not made in any, there's no way that Hametz is even near, near these products when they're being made. Uh, there is no need for, or the same is true for something like soda water. I happened to notice the other day that you know, some soda water that my wife brought home from the supermarket has Kashila Pesach on it. It's exactly the same so, so, soda water as during the year. Did they change the, the recipe in any way? I have absolutely no doubt but the answer is no. All they did was they stamped, it, uh, they printed something extra on the, the outside uh, nylon plastic wrapping. Uh, so, so that people know, because they want to know, because people care, and it's good that people care. But th those kinds of products, the answer is, for those specific types of products that I mentioned, the answer is no, you do not need a, a Kashela Pesach label. But other things you do, because there, there are no end of um, byproducts and additives, uh, dextrose, and uh, some, all kinds of dextrose and all kinds of uh, emulsifiers and all kinds of what have you uh, that can and are produced in some fashion from hamis. So it's not hamis gamur, and yes, it's also a small amount, but nevertheless, it's a sort to even even to eat even a very small amount of hamis or tarabet hamis on Pesach. It's true, you're not Hayav Karet and Tibid a Kazaith, but uh, it's a Sumin a Torah, according to most Posakim, to eat any amount of Hamas, even much less than a Kazaith uh, of, of Hamas on Pesach. So, general rule of thumb is yes, you need to have a reliable Hashkaha, which tells you that's Kashir. Thank you, Rav. Thank you very much. Our next question is Can one eat Gibracht on Passover? Yes, one may most definitely eat gebrochts on, on uh, Pesach. Uh, let us explain what gebrochts are, in case someone does not know. Gebrochts refers, literally the word gebrocht means broken. In other words, you take hard cracker type matzah, you break it up into small pieces, or you grind it up, and, uh, and then you make something, you produce some food stuff from it, such as, a classic example, knedlach. Right in Hebrew, they're called the uh, kuftaot. Um, Kneidlach is matzah meal, which is ground up matzah. Once matzah has been baked, it is kasher. It's no, it cannot become. It's not chametz, and it cannot become chametz. So you can grind it up and mix it with whatever you like, and cook whatever, make whatever you like of it. You can make a, a, a kind of. Um, uh, What's the word? A, um, forget the term. The, the Italian dish with those thick, long noodles during the year, not on Pesach, obviously. Um, so you can make something based on, uh, on using matzah meal instead of, uh, of pasta. You can make all, all manner of casseroles. You can make... Uh, lasagna? Lasagna, that's, thank you. That's the term I was looking for. Exactly so. You can make knedlach, you can make all manner of things with matzah meal. The, the minhag of, of not eating gebrochs, not eating products made of matzah, with matzah meal on Pesach is a, a, a late custom, relatively late. When I say late, that means we're, we're talking about 
it's hard to know exactly, but uh, perhaps 300 years, perhaps even a bit longer, but not, I wouldn't think much longer, but it's not mentioned before that. The earliest mentions of it really are something like, uh, like 250 or so years ago. And the reason is actually very simple. And the Balatanya himself explains in his, if you look up his Hilchot Hamas al the Kuntres Aharon, and at the beginning in the Haktalah, he explains all exactly why this came about. The way that Ashkenazim produced Nasa every year before Pesah was that it was done in a great panic, very, very quickly. What I mean to say is that. They didn't mix enough. I'm not saying this. The Balatanya writes this. Not enough water was mixed with the flour. When you don't add enough water, a liquid mixed with the flour, when you're making a dough, then you're going to end up with lumps. You can end up with lumps of dough, small lumps, big lumps, but you may find small pieces of dough which were not thoroughly uh, hydrated. And then, if that's if and if you make it very quickly, you don't really need your dough because if you need it thoroughly, then those those uh, lumps or those small spots in the in areas in the dough will be incorporated with everything else, and and you will not have these lumps or these little pockets of flour that was not properly hydrated with water. That won't happen if you need for say, shall we say, eight minutes, ten minutes. But if you're in a panic, which is how everyone. That's what happened. Everyone became panicked about making matzah. And therefore, they didn't need it very thoroughly, almost not at all. They used very little water for the same reason. They were trying to do everything very, very quickly and get it into the oven, etc. So sometimes it happened. We're talking, again, in a pre-industrial age. So matzah was always handmade. It happened sometimes, not infrequently, that in the baked matzah that was removed from the oven, the uh, you sometimes did find find a small pocket of of unhydrated, unmixed uh, flour in 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 the, in the masa. The hashash the, the, uh, was that if you now place this in, shall we say, in a bowl of soup, that the flour was if it was not properly baked could somehow become hames from the soup or the, the, the gravy or something like that. This is why, this is the basis of the, of, this is how the whole idea came came into being. And on this basis, uh, you know, you have people like Chabadnikim who who uh, move themselves three meters away from the table before they actually eat the kazayat of matzah, let us say there, and the rest of the chag, they don't touch matzah at all, because who knows if the matzah is kasher. And therefore, they eat the potatoes instead, of, which is fine if you like potatoes, but but many people don't, or many people get sick of potatoes after three or four days. There's no need for all of this. First of all, the fact is, even flour, if flour is roasted in an oven, if you take just flour, no water, just flour, you roast it in the oven properly, once it has been properly roasted in the oven, it cannot become harvest. That's also halakha. So even if you had such a pocket of, of flour, this one small area in the matzah was, was not properly hydrated and was baked in that fashion, apparently, unless it was baked improperly and very, very, uh, in a very um, uh, panicked and, and, and uh, unprofessional way, so they didn't even bake, get baked through properly, then you might think that some of this flour might not even be actually have been roasted in the heat of the, of the oven. But but all, all, all this is, A, first of all, very, very far-fetched, to put it mildly. Second of all, none of this, uh, would, none of this, this discussion could ever have even uh, come up if, if, if Masa was simply made properly, which means you use enough water, you don't make a very dry dough. You make a dough as a, as a dough should be, so that it's properly hydrated, and you knead it properly. Once you do that, and you're not, and you know that as long as you're kneading and working the dough, there's you don't have to be watching the clock at all. You don't have to be therefore be in a panic, and therefore your masal will be fine, and there's no no problem at all. Do you think it's reasonable to assume that part of the reason why the mat the matzot were not uh, needed very thoroughly is because they thought the 
18 minute rule or what's known as the 18 minute rule applied while meeting? Well, everybody knew the halacha that it doesn't apply. But when it comes to Pesach, there, there is uh, over, over generations somehow uh, a certain kind of uh, irrational, irrational types of behavior and assumptions uh, became the norm. So people decided that no matter what we're doing, whether we're needing it or not, we, we're going to get this batch of, of dough, of these masot into the oven in, within 18 minutes. Um, the 18 minute idea is also a mistaken idea for, for various reasons, which we, which we have explained in the past and we can explain again uh, another time. But assuming that even if that were the case, it's not true that you have to complete the batch in 18 minutes. It just cannot, the massage should not be sitting around according to that theory for 18 minutes. Although the real figure is not 18 minutes, it's something more like 45 minutes. But all, all of this really doesn't, uh, has, is not based on any normal, reasonable understanding of the, of the halakha and of the reality. As long as the massa is being worked, is being rolled out, is being kneaded, is being flattened, is being whatever it is, no, no himmel, no fermentation can occur. And the, 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 all, all the uh, suppositions and, and, and truly irrational claims being made about this and certain other aspects of Pesach are, are unfortunate and, and un unnecessary. It doesn't make you uh, a better Jew and it doesn't make your Pesach more meaningful if you uh, simply act in, by acting in, a, in, in an irrational manner in a manner which is the uh, opposite of what the halacha explicitly states. Thank you. Our next few questions are about Kinyoth. First one is anonymous. It asks, is there any document proving that the Hamsavi and his son Yaakov Amdan ate them, themselves ate Kinyoth on Pesach? And is their position on this issue even known? With regards to uh, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, it is known uh, that he was of the opinion that this minhag should be nullified and jettisoned. He explains why, because of the uh, the uh, high cost of masof compared to much cheaper foodstuffs like kitneot, uh, like rice, shall we say, or beans, or what have you, lentils. He was very much in favor of of, of uh, doing away with this with this uh, minhag. I'm not familiar. I do not recall at this moment if the Hakam Savi is known to have uh, uh, said the same thing. I know that yeah, Rabbi Yaakov Emden definitely did. As for the question, do we have an exp and a document which states explicitly that, uh, for instance, Rabbi Yaakov Emden was seen eating kidney off on Pesach? As far as I know, the answer is no. But that is 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 a very strange question, because let's say uh, Rashi says about a certain thing that it is mutar to eat it. No one ever asks. Well, do we have a photograph? Or do we have a written testimony of anybody saying that Rashi was seen eating this thing that he, he said is mutar? The fact that he said it's mutar is sufficient. If he said it's mutar, it's mutar. If he thought it was mutar, he, might, he probably would have eaten as well. I mean, if he wanted to. Why, why would he not do so? Why would he have said it's mutar if he wasn't sure? When Rashi was not sure about something, he, he as we all know, he was very straightforward and forthright. And he said, any or there. When it came to, for example, uh, mixing eggs into your dough, baking masa uh, ashira. Rashi says, I don't know whether eggs uh, cause the, the dough to, to rise to become hummus, because we see that it adds body and it fluffs up the dough, which is true, because that's, that's what eggs do. That's why you use them when you make a cake. Uh, Rashi says, I'm not, I'm not saying it's a sur. He says, he didn't say a sur. He said, I don't, I'm not sure, so I don't, I don't know what to tell you. 
his grandson, Rabbein Otam, was emphatic. There is no question about it. That it's not, it's Meperoth, and it's not, not Mahmitz Bichlal, and, and that's it. And I believe that that's the correct uh, opinion on the matter. But Rashi wasn't sure. He said so. If Rashi says the such and such is mutar, it's mutar. If Rabbi Yaakov Enden said, I think it should be done away with, then he, that's what he thought. It should be, should be done away with. He obviously thought it was mutar to eat kitni it could, And it could be, uh, this minha could be done away with. In practice, what he did, I don't, I do not know. I have no way of knowing, and it's not really a relevant question. The same is true of any any posek who says something such and such is mutar. No one has ever asked. Well, do we have some uh, incontrovertible testimony that uh, he actually ate it on his at his table? It's not a, a question that needs to be asked. Thank you. We have a. Uh... Two questions from Naomi. The first one is, can Bala Teshuvah Jews from an Ashkenazi background who are not raised with a Mesorah from their parents or grandparents choose whether to avoid Kitniot on Pesach? I have expressed my view going back at least uh, 16 years if not more, that any Jew from any background, Ashkenazi or otherwise, Baal Teshuvah or otherwise, in my humble opinion, may eat Kitniot on, on Pesach. Why do I say this? Because almost every single one of the Rishonim, Ashkenazi Rishonim, from Sorfat, France, Ashkenaz, Germany, where this Minhag is first mentioned, almost every single one of them rejected this minhag out of hand. They claimed that it was wrong, that it was based on a mistake, that it's an error, you shouldn't pay any attention to it. Some of the posakim were in fact very um, vehement about this and, and used very strong language, which you do not usually find with regards to such things. Rabbeinu Yeruham writes that those who do not eat kidney on Pesach he says that's a minhar shetuth. Minhar shetuth means it is a foolish, empty custom with no, no merit at all. Uh, the Tur, Rabbeinu Yaakov Ba'ra Turim, uh, calls it a humra yithera, an excessive humra. He didn't see any value to this minhar. He was an Ashkenazi. He was fully familiar with this minhar. It's also clear, by the way, that from what his language, the language of the Tur, that in his day was not yet a widespread common practice amongst Ashkenazim not to eat kidney or Pesach. He says there are those who have this minhag. He doesn't say it's minhag Ashkenazim or minhag Ashkenaz, which is what he would have said if it was uh, generally accepted amongst all the Ashkenazim. His father, the Rosh, goes out of his way to stress that you may eat rice on Pesach. And they were aware, they were all aware of this minhag that some people had. They all they were all rejecting this minhag, and they all state clearly, some of them explicitly, some implicitly, that you do not need to heed this minhag. It is based on a mistake. Uh, and I've given Shirin about this in the past. We won't go into it any further right now, but it is based on, on error and confusion. It is the it contradicts the Torah Ba'alpeh, which states that only certain types of grains can become hummus and everything else cannot. Uh, and therefore, it is a, 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 a minhag which, which is contradicted by, by, by the Torah, by the, by the uh, Tasha Ba'alpeh, by uh, all, all the major posakim who, who spoke of this minhag, who were familiar with the minhag, and, and therefore I do not think it is binding. Thank you very much. We have a very related question from Naomi. In a similar situation where uh, a Jew is a Baal Teshuvah from an Ashkenazi background and they don't have a Mesorah from their parents or grandparents, can they choose a Nusach Tefillah? Yes, I've been asked this question before and I believe any Jew, again, doesn't matter from what background, Baal Teshuvah or otherwise, may choose the, the Nusach Tefillah that they prefer. You're not nusach tefillah is not something that is regulated by minhag avot as the 
the Posek, the famous Posek from 500 odd years ago, the Maharaj Dam, writes explicitly, uh, the concept of minhar avot, where it, where it is relevant, where it does apply, does not is, is, is a valid concept, but it does not apply to this field of Musaf Tefila. He, he gives this answer to Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews who moved to Turkey in his day, where he lived, where most of the Jews was Faradi, and uh, they ask him, well, do we have to set up our own Beth Knesset, where we'll dove in Musa Ashkenaz, as we used to, or can we join the Sfaradi Kehilot, the Minyanim, the Beth Knesset? And he says, no, you can join the Sfaradi. Uh, in other words, you can do, uh, in this regard, whatever you prefer. I will state, for the record, that uh, generally all, all Nusha'ot are legitimate and valid. You can dove in any Nusach you like. However, I will tell you that the Nusach known as Nusach Sefarad is, I think, the, the worst of all possible worlds. It is a, a late invention, not, not more than 220 odd years old, uh, or 230 years old at the very most. It is a very poorly cobbled together uh, amalgam of Nusah Hashkenaz and Nusah of the Sfaradim. It is, it is, uh, it does not flow. It is full of uh, extraneous and superfluous uh, repetitions and, and uh, wordings. And it's, it's simply, I, I don't see why anyone would choose that, that Nusah. If you're used to it and you, and you don't want to change, fine, okay. There's no, it's not a story, it's not a problem at all. But to choose that Nusach, I certainly cannot imagine why you would choose to do so. Nusach Hashkenaz, on the other hand, for example, is a, has a pedigree that goes back at least a thousand years, probably more. We, we have precisely the same Nusach Hashkenaz that we have today, already being uh, laid out and, and uh, in, explained in detail, word by word, going back 850 years. And, and those people mentioned many, many generations before them who, who passed this Nusach down to them. So it's been around for at least a thousand years and it hasn't changed. A few odd, tiny errors or, or uh, sense, uh, cases of censorship crept in here and there. But apart from that, it's almost without any, no, no meaningful, significant change at all. Uh, the Nusach of the Temanim, which is the Nusach of the Rambam, which the Rambam almost certainly uh, came up by himself with, is uh, also goes back, therefore, um, something like uh, 850 years. Uh, and and other um, one can one can trace them back, very various num varying numbers of 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 centuries, depending on which nusach we're talking about. So a person can choose. Yes, if that's what one's, one wants to do, one can do so. Thank you. And more generally, does the concept of Minha Gavoth ever apply in a case where one is not living in the same Kihila as their forefathers were? I'm not sure I understand the question. Like if they live in a different community, if they move to a different community, is there any inyan of keeping Minhagavoth when their forefathers were from a different community than the, the one that they're in now? The general concept of Minhagavoth uh, is, uh, this is a longer discussion. The, the halachi concept really is Minhagavoth. Minhagavoth mm -hmm. refers to something that is accepted in a certain community or area, locale, and involves not doing something which is mutar misad hadin, something that according to Allah has mutar, but there's a practice for various reasons not to do this thing in this area, and all the Jews in this area follow this practice and accept this custom. Such a minhav in that area is binding. It, it's not the concept of minhav avoth doesn't actually appear in Chazal. It is mentioned later by uh, certain Ashkenazi Rishonim. Such expressions exist in the Tosafoth, in various Ashkenazi Rishonim, for the simple reason that they knew either 
consciously or subconsciously, they knew that many of their practices differed from the some of the Babylonian traditions, that which appears in the Tawad Bavli or that which some of the Gonim and Bavel wrote, and they knew that they had a different tradition. They knew that this, this was not by chance. Uh, and they were, and they did not feel that they should change the, these ancient practices. And I think they were entirely correct. They themselves did not even always know um, that their practices or their minharim or their nusha'ot actually could be traced back to Eretz Israel or surrounding uh, localities, sometimes back to the time of the Talmud and the Mishnah. Uh, they did not always know this, but they they were they were convinced that there was there was no it wasn't just some random error that crept into the into the into the system, and ninety nine percent of the time that that assumption was a correct assumption. So if so according to the basic halacha and the Talmud, uh, as it appears in in, in Rishonim, in the Rambam, for example, if you move away to a different a locality. Then the mean, the, that mean hug which applied and, and obligated you in, in a different place no no longer applies to you. That is true. Now some Posakim claimed, well, if many people from locality A now pick up and move away to locality B, shall we say people were living in Eastern Europe, and many of them picked up and emigrated to the United States, which is true. You know, something like two million Jews emigrated from from uh, Russia, Ukraine, to uh, the United States in, in uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, living you know. So that they, some of these Posakim claim that if many people pick up en masse, it's as if the entire community picked up and moved away, and therefore they're obligated to maintain the same practices, because if, as if the Makom hasn't changed. That is a, a claim which requires uh, proof which I've never seen really uh, uh, adduced. I have not seen such proof adduced to, to really back up that claim. I understand the idea behind it. The idea behind it is, is a more intuitive idea, that if all these Jews were used to doing things in a certain way, and tradition is an important part of, of Jewish practice, which it is, no question, then it's better to be more conservative and not make changes and do things, continue to do things as they were done in the old country. I understand the, the reasoning behind that, but to make the claim that it's a, a purely halachic concept uh, is not, I do not think that is true. And therefore, when it comes to certain uh, issues, I think uh, it, this is not something that has to, to be the, the uh, overarching consideration. Sometimes perhaps it should be, and other times perhaps not. Depends on the on the topic at hand. When it comes to Kitniyoth, my claim has nothing to do with people moving around or emigrating. It has to do with the fact that I don't think it was a valid binding custom in Poland either, because uh, almost none of the Ashkenazi Rishonim, uh, maybe with the exception of one, uh, uh, none of them thought that this was a, a correct practice that should be taken seriously. It's it's curious and they're very it's very strange how we just, we find in the, that in the 15th century Leminyanam it seems to have all of a sudden taken on a life of its own. There's the the Minhag of Kitniot, for example. How this was, how this came about, it's not very clear to me at all. But I know for a fact that a hundred years before that time it was not the case because the tour tells me so. For example. All right, let's continue. All right, thank you very much. We have a few questions about the Seder. The first one is, can one have their Seder before Tzed HaKochavim if they pray Arvith early? How early and does this apply for the second day of Yom Tov? On the first day, the answer is no. It should be only from Tzed HaKochavim. With regards to uh, Kiddush, if we're talking about the first cup, uh, that's just a bit before Seta Kochavim. I don't think that's a problem, like Kiddush and any other Shabbat or Yom Tov. But the, Hag the Haggadah and certainly the eating of Masa, etc., has to be after Seta Kochavim. With regards to the second day in the Gola, I think there is room to be Mekel. Thank you very much. 
And this year in, in the Gola, Shabbat is the, the day after Pesach Shani, or the second day of, 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 the, of the Yom Tov. Would one be allowed to start that one early too, Shabbat, in that week? Let me just uh, look for one second at the at my calendar here. You're, you're referring to the second day of Pesach of the Hag? Uh, no. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, Shabbat it follows the second day of Pesach. Right. So the first day is, is, is Yom Hamishi, it's the first day of Pesach. Yom, Yom Tov, Rishon. In Chutzlat, you have uh, Yom Tov Shani on, the, on Yom Shishi on the Friday. And then you have Shabbat. So that, that's what we're discussing, correct? Yes. Okay, so what's the question? So you'd be able to bring in Shabbat early. Ah, can you bring in Shabbat early? On the what? Yom Tov. Why would you not be able to bring in Shabbat or Yom Tov early? I've, 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 I've explained and given Shirim on, on, on this uh, fact, with, even with regards to uh, Shavuot, for example. There is certainly Mutar, despite the, the claims that some people have made, I think it is certainly mutab to to bring in Shavuot early, which is in the summer, and it's a long day, and some people find it vastly preferable to do so. There's no reason not to do so. You can, like any Shabbat, any Yom Tov, you can, you can do so. So why would you not be able to bring Shabbat in, you know, which is the, the third day of Pesach now? What's the, what's the difference? Even with regards to the second day, I said that because the reason not to do the Seder before nightfall has to do with the hova to eat masa at night. Has to do with the hova to to uh, the, the saper b'siat misraim to speak about about b'siat misraim uh, at that time when the the, the hova for eating masa exists, which means at night. That applies to the first day. The second day would, is a min, is really a minhal or something like that. Uh, some, that's that's the general. Uh, or it's a takana, but it's also a minhal. Has a strange kind of status somewhere between one and the other, uh, and it would lichora be reasonable to be more flexible about the time frame on the second day. But with regards to Shabbat, I don't see any any question at all. Kol tov, hayu beruchim. He's cool. Thank you. Shalom lachem. Thank you, Rabbi Bar Chaim. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers. If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one, if you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Israel, or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.